gonna ask you guys to introduce yourself in actually in a slightly different way. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourselves like in 15 seconds, if you wanted this audience to remember one thing about yourself and your company, you know, what would that be? And in your case, uh, Frederick, that's actually, my question is like, you're probably the least known billion dollar company. Uh, so. by, by market cap, that's probably yeah. true, yeah. But I would say that yeah. in our games, the star is the gamer. So we say that we make the game, but you create the stories, right? So right. you're supposed to create the stories. We're not creating them cool. for you, right? So the star is the gamer. Holly. Uh, Kabam, we make mobile games, and we just had a phenomenal exit this year to Netmarble and Fox Next for a price tag between one to two billion. So it's a market out there. Okay. Well, Hi, hi, Wilhelm, Rovio. It's been a busy year. <laughs> it's been a busy year. It's been okay. a busy year. <laughs> Enrique? Well, uh, we are known for being a very creative studio. That, that's probably our craziest games, like Surgeon Simulator and I Am Bread. Speak for, for that. Players, the star. Big exit, big outcomes. Busy. Busy Absol year. Absolutely amazing What's year, to be honest. Suit? Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the suit. To We're be on, gamers. Uh, do, do we have about 20 seconds that it takes? Yeah, we can, we can take the 20 seconds. Yeah. I, I literally had an Iron Maiden but an Angry Birds t-shirt that I was going to wear. But I had to dash out from a, from a, from a lunch with, uh, with Sir Prince William. Uh, oh, with Sir drive, Prince William, okay. And, and drive at about 120 miles an hour here and leave my car to a volunteer and then dash in. <laughs> and then hence I'm in a... Uh, that's, that's more enough time for Superman to change, but... That's okay. true, yeah, that's but that's fine, you know. Perfect, <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll buy the suit, we'll be, you're, you're okay, you're okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. We'll let you in, I appreciate we'll let you that. in. I appreciate that. Holly, I have a question about you, for, to you. So, kebam. Yeah. Lots of industry consolidation happen, uh, it's, it, it, it got sold like two or three times. It's the same company that got sold. Yeah. What's happening? Tell us yeah. a bit about that and maybe if we can then transition into like consolidation in the game industry, that'd be amazing. Yeah, sure. I can, I can say really quick. We got onto mobile early 2012. Yeah. Um, the, top, no, the number 100 game was making $300,000 a month. The number one game in 2012 was making $4 million a month on okay. mobile. Flash forward three years alone, the number 100 game is making $1.2 million a month, but the number one game is making $80 million a month. Wow. So you could just see how much the market just shifted, and that for us signaled like, oh my gosh, it, it's not good enough to be like top 100, and it's not even good enough to be top 50. You had to get it into the top 10 in order to like subsist. Our studio was rather large, um, and just to kind of make the profits. So that's what's kind of, in 2015, we just saw all of these things that were happening mm. with the market changing. And um, we started doubling down. We started killing a lot of projects and just focusing on a couple of things. That's just our okay. studio. We said we just couldn't do the marketing for each of those little games anymore. So what, what do you guys think are the big exit drivers right now in, um, in, kind of like in the games industry? Yeah, so I think some, I, I actually think consolidation is one of the largest exit drivers, you know, yeah. because in order yeah. for you to collect all that revenue, uh, you kind of need to band together. Uh, the IPO markets were really poor for during our time when we were, we yeah. were running it. So we saw a lot of um, kind of companies acquiring other companies as well. And that it's just how the market yeah. just blew up that way. And I think that is the number one driver. Okay. And I mean, you guys, uh, of course, you know, uh, Frederick, you know, Paradox, you know, billion dollar market cap. Rovio, you know, close to billion dollar market cap as well. So what's the, um, I mean, how do you see this game industry consolidation? Sorry? How do you see the games industry consolidation yourself? I mean, what yeah, do you think well, is the... You can see it very apparently, and, and it, some companies are very aggressive out there. You see some big Chinese companies, for example, who are really on, on the hunt for a lot yeah. of different companies. In our IPO, Tencent bought 5%. That's one example, yeah. and I know they invested in over 40 companies. So I think American companies, they are buying to be to defend a position while the Chinese Sorry. companies are buying to take over the world. Yeah. So it, it's a do That's totally true. different approach. Yeah, they're very interested in like getting revenue. That's yeah. why they were looking at gaming companies. Okay. I think you know, consolidation uh, naturally comes as a result, I think especially in the mobile game space, as of, an, of a maturing industry. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's just a phase that, that comes 
uh, naturally. And we've, we've stated openly and clearly that, that this is also part of our, our growth strategy moving forward. And okay. uh, the, the IPO itself was a, was a natural phase to, to get to a further growth mode. And uh, as, as our, our main shareholder uh, put it very well, is, is now we have a bit of a currency in the market that we can, that we can, we can operate with. Actually, on that point, um, so you guys have done an amazing turnaround. The movie was amazing. You've done this IPO and all that. Then recently, you've had a, a bit of a rough time. So it's kind of addressing a little bit of elephant in the room here, if you what know what elephant, I mean. What elephant? What <laughs> elephant? <laughs> There's been a slight drop in the share price. How do you feel about that? Well, um, uh. in general, I, I th there's, there's two components to this. Uh, user acquisition, very big data-driven user acquisition, uh, is a bit of a new thing. It, it's, not, it's not overly complex uh, when you summarize it at the high level and explain it, but it's very new. Um, and I think in here, uh, we have worked and we continue to work diligently to make sure that that uh, component and how that works is really understood amongst uh, the investor community, the market. Um, and we're, we're, we're getting there. We have a, we, we, we have a very accurate uh, data model. We have an incredible amount of data uh, that, we, that we process to make sure that we, we work diligently in, in, in this space. And uh, we recently launched a new great game, Angry yep. Birds Match, uh, yep. just at the end of August, practically in the beginning of September. And um, uh, we, we, we're very happy with that. And naturally, we scale up a new game with, with amazing KPIs. The other bit that, that, um, that also affected uh, last, last week's happenings were, were movie revenues. We, yep. we, we movie, a movie pays itself back over time. And, yeah. and there are natural month-over-month -month fluctuations uh, in, in how that payback, payback actually looks, uh, considering how, how the payback model works. And that was the other, other factor that, that, uh, that uh, affected okay. our, our last week's happenings. Understood. So we have you know, two major game companies here, public companies, quite a big one as well with Kabam. Smaller, very creative startup uh, with Bosa Studios. And the question I have to ask is, um, you know, I mean, I myself had a small studio that wasn't big enough to do an IPO by itself, so I sold my business, you know, uh, to a company called Stillfront because I felt that we didn't have the size to succeed uh, in this market. The market is super competitive. I think the number is like 3,000 games on mobile at least come out every week. Of those, maybe two or three will make money. And I'm probably being optimistic with that number. How big do you have to be to succeed? I mean, in your case, it's a bit different. You do PC and games, but still, how big do you need to be to, be to succeed in this market? Can the indies still do something? Well, uh, I think very few people can do a lot of things. And I think, first of all, you have to define what succeed means. If you're aiming for the numbers that Kabam is putting up, I mean, it's going to be very hard to start from scratch, right? Yeah. So if you aim to at least make money, you just need to stay focused and be more niche and not try to go for the big market. So if you see King succeed with the match three that they're doing very well, you shouldn't go for that specific market just because the market is big. So yeah. if you're a small team, go for the niche and try to satisfy the niche as good as you can. And that's what we've been doing as well. So we've been growing the niche instead of trying to make games easier to play. So. Okay. Yeah, but I would say that probably the question for me is the other way around, is that how small can you remain while still be relevant, right? Because it is a known quantity that your company is only as good as the people who make up your company, right? And finding very good talent is very hard. And the more people you put on a team, the more com complications come with it. It's difficult to extract performance of that team. And particularly creativity suffer with numbers as well, because when you have a lot of voices and opinions, uh, the common denominator is the only thing that everybody can agree on, and that yeah. seems to be the solution for all, right? Uh, we are around 70 people now, okay. but we don't have a single team which is more than 20. We, that is the number that will work for us. So we have these small, super empowered and independent teams because we believe that that kind of size is the size that brings the disruption, the new leap forward in, in, in anything that you are doing, and uh, the, you can extract the top performance of your top uh, employees at that magic number, if you wish. So do you, you guys think there's a trade-off between the size of the company, how big you are, and your ability to innovate? 
Well, it depends. If you look yeah. at Google, it's massive, and they still innovate a lot. Yeah, but they lose money on everything they innovate almost, so. Yeah, true. Yeah. But is innovation about making money, right? Like, how, how are you defining innovation? That's a good point. In some ways, right? So sometimes you can't put a price tag on measuring diabetes with contact lenses, right? So I think it all depends how you measure innovation. I think in the creative space, we all know that if you don't innovate, you will die. Like yeah. literally, and that's where for like us creatives, always thinking about okay, how in, in our next game or the update of, to the game, how do we make it so that because I think players are super smart, they know when a reskin happens. Trust me, we went down yeah. that path. <laughs> they're not dumb. They know exact. They're like, yeah, we played the, this one before, but, and it's but not the reskins exciting. still work. They still make plenty of money. Yeah, so I, I will say, uh, from personal experience at Kabam, when we try to like reskin our games, yeah. it was always derivative revenue. It right. was always diminutive derivative. In yeah, it would just okay. uh, it's derivative, right? It just would kind of and diminish over time. Okay. So it was never as big as the main one, and I think people know that. Now, don't get me wrong; people copy each other, but there's always a bit of some type of innovation, or I'd like to think like evolutionary, because I always think people are more evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Um, so they always want to know where the home button is versus like how do I turn this on. So I, I definitely think. Um, you know, innovation could look very different. And for, for some people, they're like, wow, this is really innovative. And they're like, oh, you put the home button there, <laughs> right? So I think it all depends how you categorize it. What do you think? Do you think that your size is um, somehow, like, making it harder for you to innovate? Yeah, I think so. We've, grow, we've grown from seven people 13 years ago to 300 today. And you see that the structure makes it harder for people to innovate. And people have no idea where to go with yeah. their ideas, right? Yeah. So you have this bunch of amazing creative people. Uh, that, that's why you hire people, right? So, and they have no idea how to escalate a good idea and to whom. And you have to really work with that. Okay. So talking about innovation. Um, could you, each one of you tell me, in 2018, what is going to be really hot? What's really the thing that, like, ah, oh, this is going to kill it? And what's going to be really, really, really crap? It just won't fly, it won't work in the games industry. Um, Want to start? Yeah, I'd, lo I'd, I'd love to a little bit improvise on, <laughs> on that topic. The, um, there's going to be more of the same, which is always, there's always more that there will be consolidation, there will be many of the trends we see this year. Um, we, 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 this 2017 was the latest year of, of AR and VR, and 2019 is then going to be an, another year of AR and, and, and VR. Um, there might be some surprises on the AR, AR front, I think. Um, okay. the, the, I mean, the fact is Google and, and, and Apple do treat it as a, as a tremendously important topic. Yeah, it's a priority for them now, uh, very it clearly. Is, yeah, it yeah. clearly is. And, um, and, and uh, the practical use of, of artificial intelligence within mobile game development, in QA, level design, etc., okay. obviously a very hot topic. And then one would, I guess, I mean, it's not really a competitor. Uh, it's, it's more of a friend. Uh, one has to mention Harry Potter. Harry Potter, of course. One has to just mention, just the drop antic. it out there. Yeah. Um, the antic, yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know, it, like, Harry, Pokemon was a great yeah. brand for, for location-based gaming. It was perhaps the best brand uh, for location-based gaming. Yeah. Harry Potter seems to be a very, very strong choice well, it's as a treat, well. I think the brand is three times bigger. It's a huge than brand. Than Pokemon. So yeah, it's a huge brand. If they get it right, that's interesting, I agree. I'd say it's one to watch, so you've got sure. So you cheat a little bit. So you've got the hot stuff is AI, potentially Harry Potter. AR. And AR. Yeah, and, I think and, that like those, those, are, those are overall okay. industry trends and, and okay. things that, that we, are, we are studying very, very carefully um, okay. in, in our end. And on our, on our side, um, games as services is yeah. nothing new. Uh, per se, but the way you define services uh, is changing every year. Okay. Uh, games are games on mobile are are they have a stronger pulse than ever before, and and they they are they are built to to really become digital hobbies. Yeah. And uh, and they will get better next year because they get better every year, and we will be su surprised about some of the tricks that. That Kabam, Kabam pulls out of their sleeve, and Rovio pulls out of their sleeve, and 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 rest of the guys pull out of their sleeve next year. So actually, Holly, what do you think is going to be hot next year, and what do you think is uh, going to be like a dud? 
So I'm pretty bullish on eSports. E I think it's one of the fastest growing kind of kissing cousin to games. And what's really cool about eSports is now it can involve a much wider audience. You don't have to be a gamer to be an eSport fan or to even be part of that market. And it's one of the fastest growing places that I see. And then what's really interesting about it is also um, the idea, I mean, you still Sorry, need to be on in the e sports. Do you see eSports going to mobile? Uh, some, yeah, there's definitely, there's a huge game in Tencent. Um, yeah. You might know what it is. I can't remember the name of it, but oh, it's, mobile a, it's a mobile game. Yeah. Something game. Heroes. Yeah. Something, something. Yeah. There's a ki yeah. maybe King of Heroes, something of right. something. Heroes of Honor. Heroes of Honor, thank you. Yeah. So, um, and that, that just blew up really big. So I definitely yeah. think everybody who's thinking about doing a mobile game is certainly kind of thinking, hey, what's that next, like, how do you kind of make it? open to somebody who doesn't play games because that audience is so much wider. Do you want to react quickly yeah. to that one? Yeah, I, like the, 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 this idea of mobile esports, I think it's, it's fascinating um, to think of it, let's turn it around a little bit and let's, let's think, of a, let's think of, of a market where there's over two billion soccer balls having been sold to consumers worldwide. Yeah. But nobody had figured out what to do with them at that point, soccer. You know? and, yeah. and then somebody introduces a shock to the system. Somebody introduces soccer. Okay. And boom. That's, that's the mobile phone. That's, cool. that's there's, there's so many high-powered smartphones in the pockets and hands of consumers worldwide sitting and waiting for soccer. But I will say that one of the hardest things is that um, the average American adult, guess how much the apps they download a month? 0 0.1. 0 .1. So they're not oh, looking yeah. for anything new. You already have your apps, okay. and I just think the discovery is so incredible. Well, that's why the app oh, is a mature market. It is yeah. a mature market. It's very mature, mm -hmm. exactly. Frederick, what's hot in 2018? What's uh, crap? Well, I think uh, 2018 is going to be the year where the gamers take the power back. And we've seen that with the loot box debacle that EA yeah. faced with Star Wars Battlefront 2. Uh, and you've seen that in numerous different places. You see that with the GDPR legislation that is happening in the EU. So all of a sudden, we can't just collect, collect data. We can't just treat people the way we want to do business. We actually need to care about the gamers. And we need full transparency. We need to agree with the gamer on the business model, not just shove it in their face. And I think that's going to be very apparent in the coming year. When it comes to products, I think AR is going to location-based gaming, if you call it that. And deepest down in the fridge, you will find virtual reality. Yes. Yeah. Stone yeah. cold. You um, think in 2018? Oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah. Already dead. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, dead. well, it's not dead, but it's struggling. Um, you know, when you meet VR companies these days and you say, you're a VR company, they say, yeah, but we do other things as well. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that's the first one. Um, and um, the second one, I don't even remember, but it's... <laughs> but I, I kind of feel like there's like, so been a ton of capital, remember. but like no eyeballs. The market hasn't been there, so... But yeah. I say like, it's the been. best solution you've ever seen that is still looking for a problem. <laughs> yeah, true. yeah in, true. It, I, I can compound a little bit on that, right? The dream of VR we all share. So you're immersed in a game, etc. right? The reality is a subset of that. It's super high-end. If you have an HTC Vive or whatever, you have a super setup, it's super expensive, it's heavy, you are tethered, you're not free, there's still a cable holding you, right? And that, that's a subset of the vision of VR, and this is why adoption by the mass market is slow. And yeah. I think that AR might not be the year yet as well, because of that. AR as a vision is completely like, uh, is, a, is a pair of glasses, which I wear, and the world is overlaid with information and metadata and everything is better. And but what we have in reality right now is a subset of that, right. which is a device that you have to hold. And so I, I, I'm always very careful when, when uh, uh, the first step of technology is so far away from the fully sci-fi vision of it. Right. I have no, no question whatsoever that AR is the future, right? right. When AR is done well, it's, yeah. it's game over. That's the interface we're going to use. But this iteration of AR, be tentative, be, be careful for that. But All right. If you give VR five years, it might hit, but 2018, it's going to be stone cold. Yeah, yeah it's, it's going to be like the market is not there. Waking okay. up after a massive yeah. party with the biggest hangover ever. Exactly. <laughs> and people talk yeah, about yeah. The, the idea of strapping a mobile phone to your face. That, that's even a step down from, from yeah. the proper VR. So that's even more difficult to accept. It's more ubiquitous, 
but it's a further away from the dream, right? right. So this is why right. I think there is a problem. In terms of what should work in 2018, as you were saying, AI, uh, not only in analytics and so on, but also how we build games with the help of AI, because we love ideas, right? We create an idea for a game, but when you go to execute, oh my God, there's a grind, so many people, so much time. So if we can deploy AI to accelerate that and free our resources more to be creative, I think that's a trend that will start getting traction in 2018. And what you do is another one, is niches, right? right. If you find a niche and explore that uh, niche, niches, yeah. it's global niches, right? I, nobody does this better than Paradox. You find yeah. your audience and you're the best in class in that and you're a billion dollar company, right? There you go. So, uh, of course, you guys are the king of mainstreams. <laughs> no, no problem with that. But if you find yourself a niche and you explore that niche well, I yeah. think you will succeed in 2018 and 2019 because of the problems around discoverability have not been sorted yet. Absolutely. And I think you guys are the kings of creativity. At I'll take that up to the bank. At Bosa. Um, I have a question from the audience, actually. I think you guys, you guys can use the thing called slido.com for questions. So the question from Anonymous uh, is, uh, like that's it. a brave person. Um, is paid user acquisition still a viable growth strategy or have the prices been driven up too much? It is, and I think on, um, on a macro level in, in, in user acquisition, one, one would be wise to expect that prices tend to go up over time. At the, at the end of the day, uh, the cost for acquisition is a, is a reflection of whatever the average high LTVs are for the, for the companies that buy a, lot of, buy a lot of mobile impressions or relevant impressions in general, plus whatever the average uh, return on investment requirement is on, on user acquisition. That's just like, a, it's, it's a simple mathematical formula at a macro level to understand how it actually works together. Now, the, what does that mean for, 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 let's say, an indie developer? Yeah. Well, it means that, that if, you wanna, if you wanna operate in this space, and take advantage of user acquisition at a high scale, that puts certain requirements on your game. And that, may, that means that for your game, you have to engineer your game to make sure that you can actually do that. Requires very, very high engagement from the game. Very, very long retention from the game. And yes, it requires also business sense. It requires monetization for a game. And it also, if you're then gonna, over time, compete in the space of user acquisition, which is a global auction place, yeah. there are only so many impressions every day for sale, then it means that you will have to stay with your game for a long time and you will have to further develop it and you will have to run it as a service. Those are just, those are just the factors of how free-to-play mobile gaming works. A long-winded answer to say yeah. that yes, yeah. but <laughs> still viable but, but okay. there are <laughs> fundaments in place that you have to yeah. keep in mind. Perfect. Yeah. Guys, we have uh, two minutes left, and uh, I wanted to conclude really quickly, give you each a chance to actually forget 2018, where we've buried VR, <laughs> among other <laughs> things, and jump forward to 2028, and you each have 20 seconds, and tell me, please, what will be your gaming experience in 2028? My gaming experience will be AI orchestrated, so we will have this game director on top of your game, figuring out what you like to play, who you're going to play with, what do you like to play like, and you'll okay. be creating on the fly that experience for you. Perfect. Incredibly immersive. Incredibly immersive. So like the, the expectation for entertainment will only increase. And going forward 10 years is, is like, that's when VR might be a thing. Like okay. I look at my, my, my children. It comes how back every 10 years. Huh? It, it do well, that's actually <laughs> true. And I, I, you know, I go back to the vision of VR when I was a kid, and oh okay. my god. But the, the, ki the younger generation, how excited are they? And they are the people we have to look at when we think 10 years ahead. Perfect. Holly? Uh, I think I don't have to be intentional about gaming. Like, it'll just push to me like ads, or I just think it and it's going to turn on and I just won't have to be any intentional. It's all going to be pushed. All going to be pushed to you. Frederick, to conclude? 100% social. So you play with your friends, you play with people all over the world, no matter what you play. So today you choose whether to be social or not. And you can do that in the future as well, obviously, because when you think it, it happens. So, but much more social than today. 100% social. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. Oh, one last thing. On Go, that note, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. The definition of reality 
is going to be an interesting question over the next 10 years. Okay, that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much, guys. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. I enjoyed it. Thank you.